All right, so let's jump right into vesiculobullous diseases. So there are many causes of vesicle and bulla formation in dermatology. We have to think in broad categories. So infection definitely must be ruled in or ruled out. Spongiotic dermatitis, interface dermatitis, autoimmune processes, metabolic disorders, acantholytic disorders, trauma, and a whole host of other causes. So we'll kind of go over these one by one, but just as an outline here, you can visualize the topics that we will cover. When we think about blistering diseases, we also have to think about the level of the split that is occurring to be able to organize the differential diagnosis. So you can have clean subcorneal splits, intraepidermal splits, and subepidermal splits. And you can see the, the list of entities that are located within these categories more often than not. So we will go over these. So any dermatology resident is going to spend some time trying to memorize the basement membrane. So an understanding of the basement membrane architecture is the first step into understanding autoimmune blistering diseases. This is the famous cartoon from Bologna here, and it's showing kind of a protein-protein interaction cartoon and how the basement membrane is organized. So here in the at the level of the keratinocytes, you have intermediate filaments in the basal keratinocytes connecting to bullous pemphigoid antigen 1 and plectin, which are forming a complex with a couple of other different proteins here, bullous pemphigoid antigen 2, which extends all the way down through the lamina lucid to the lamina densa, integrin subunits alpha 6 and beta 4, which can interact all the way down through the lamina lucid and touching laminin 332, which is in the lamina densa. So you can see this kind of complex four protein interaction here. The main protein that makes up the lamina densa is type four collagen. And as you go below the lamina densa, it's an aptly named sub lamina densa region. The most important proteins to know in this area are type seven collagen, which you can see forming these structures called anchoring fibrils. And you can see here type one and three collagen, which are the major component of the dermis. So practice kind of visualizing this in your mind, maybe drawing it out so that you have a, a really basic understanding of the protein names and the levels that they are located as well. And so this is important because each one of these proteins, if it's dysfunctional, dysfunctional in any way, or um, genetically mutated or attacked by an autoantibody, then what you're going to have is a resulting disease phenotype. And so being able to correlate the protein to the disease phenotype is going to be very important. Starting out with subcorneal blisters, the two main things that you should know about are pemphigus foliaceous and subcorneal pustular dermatosis. You can also have an IgA pemphigus that is predominantly subcorneal, which we will talk about. I, I will say here that you can have infections that cause subcorneal bulla. Um, you can have acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis, which is a type of reaction. And we covered those really in the inflammatory lectures, but just to mention here, um, these are not the only causes of subcorneal blisters, but for the purposes of putting them into an autoimmune category, um, we're putting them in this lecture. So starting out with pemphigus foliaceous, we see superficial crusted erosions on the face and trunk. Usually you don't have great blister formation because the level of pathology is more superficial. So the epidermis ruptures easily and you mainly get these superficial erosions and crusts. So that subcorneal location of splits makes them very fragile. Classically, pemphigus foliaceous does not have mucosal involvement. And that's because the autoantibodies against desmoglein 1, yes, they are there, but there's enough desmoglein 3 to keep the structure of the mucosal epidermis intact. So um, 
desmoglein one is the predominant target in pempigus foliaceus. Patients will have typically an autoantibody that's directly targeted to that protein. Remember that desmoglein one is also a target of uh, exo of the exotoxins in staph scalded skin, and you can see uh, a, a subcorneal split in staph scalded skin syndrome, as well as bullous and petigo because desmoglein one is affected. There is a variant that we like you to know about, pemphigus erythematosus. It's kind of a combination of pemphigus foliaceus with lupus-like presentation. So you have this uh, lupus-like distribution of erythematous plaques and patches. Usually the patient's ANA positive that kind of helps make the diagnosis. The histology looks a lot like pemphigus foliaceus, but on direct immunofluorescence, instead of having more of an interepidermal uh, pattern, you also have a full house lupus band DIF. So here are uh, just uh, some lesion examples of kind of the superficial erosions and crusts uh, that have been likened to some type of, I think, corn cornflake cereal type presentation because it's rippling, it's kind of thin, superficial, and this is a classic codochrome for pemphigus foliaceus. So as we said, pemphigus foliaceus is a subcorneal blister. You might see eosinophils, neutrophils, and dyskeratotic cells. You'll definitely want to look for acantholysis, loss of attachment between the keratinocytes, and dyskeratosis in the granular layer. So this is at the granular layer split. Now you may just see epidermis splitting off and without really seeing a granular layer or without observing abundant amounts of acantholysis, but you're really looking for that level of split in the granular layer. On direct immunofluorescence, you'll see that net-like IgG and C3 in the upper half of the epidermis. Remember, the upper half is affected because desmoglein 1 is predominantly located in the upper half of the epidermis, whereas the concentration of desmoglein 1 starts to decrease as you go further down towards the basal layer. And conversely, the desmoglein 3 levels increase as you go down towards the basal layer. Just a H and E example here of a, a granular layer split, and you can have neutrophils, you can have some dyskeratotic cells, acanthalytic cells, all within that subcorneal space at the level of the granular layer. Remember, you could see some spongiotic change in the rest of the epidermis as you're seeing here. Now, um, if there is no clinical data on this, um, hopefully. There's a DIF pending on this case, but definitely doing fungal stains and making sure that there's no infection here. Sometimes neutrophilic rich inflammation with acanthalysis, you have to look hard for evidence of potential giant cells. They can be easily missed depending on how many neutrophils are within the inflammation and consider something like herpes infection as well. This is a very posse immune split. So you can see that granular layer level of split, a few acanthalysis cells here, but nothing uh, striking in terms of the amount of cells that you can see exhibiting acanthalysis, individual acanthalysis rather, but you see very clean acanthalytic split at the level of the granular layer. Surprisingly, not a lot of inflammation. So you can or cannot have a lot of inflammation and, um, doing the ancillary diagnostic testings, DIF, correlating with clinical presentation, ruling out infection is absolutely key in making the diagnosis. Here is an example of the DIF finding, again, net-like IgG and C3 in the upper half of the epidermis. Moving on to subcorneal pustular dermatosis, this is actually more of a diagnosis of exclusion, but typically you'll see this in older females. They'll present with annular lesions of the flexural surfaces or folds with pustules at the periphery. You can see it in males as well, and you can see some atypical morphologic variants, so don't get boxed into these criteria. Typically, there's no mucosal involvement, and there's an interesting association with monoclonal gammopathies, particularly IgA. Some clinical examples of that annular erythematous thin plaque 
and on the right, some kind of uh, collections of uh, pustular material within these uh, bulla, and some of them have ruptured, some of them have formed some kind of yellow crusting. You always have to think, is this impetogenized secondarily? Um, that can complicate the picture because if you've got impetogenized blisters, you're gonna wanna think about bullus impetigo, so which came first. Um, but biopsying something that's more of a sterile pustule, doing a DIF perilesionally, getting a negative DIF, getting um, subcorneal pustules and ruling out infection would kind of leave you in the realm of a uh, Sten Wilkinson or subcorneal pustular dermatosis. That being said, it is um, a diagnosis of exclusion and also a diagnosis of fitting with your overall clinical impression. So uh, it's not, this diagnosis is not made every day in dermatology, but it's something you will miss if you're not out looking for it. So again, subcorneal pustular dermatosis, you, you want to see that subcorneal pustule. It can be filled with neutrophils. It can be filled with fibrin. Usually you don't see dyskeratosis. We like to look for dyskeratosis in other entities like Derrier's disease, which we'll talk about. You can see that in pemphigus vulgaris many times. Um, you can see dyskeratosis in, in other inflammatory entities as well. However, we usually are not looking for dyskeratosis in this entity. Superficial perivascular mixed infiltrate with neutrophils. I know that that's uh, not a super specific inflammatory pattern. Again, this is all about um, excluding other diagnoses. DIF is negative. Now, if the DIF is positive, then by definition, it's not going to be Snun-Wilkinson because if the DIF is positive for IgG and C3 in a nut-like pattern, you might be thinking more of a pemphigus foliaceous. If uh, you had an IgA positivity, you might be thinking of a subcorneal pustular variant of IgA pemphigus. So um, DIF is absolutely essential to making the diagnosis, and that's because we need to prove that it's negative before you consider calling it Snedden and Wilkinson. Here is a snapshot of some subcorneal pustules, as you would see in this entity. DIF would be negative perilesionally. All right, so we're moving on to intraepidermal blisters. We'll talk about pemphigus vulgaris invariants, Haley Haley, Derriers, Grovers, and perineoplastic pemphigus. Now, these middle three are not necessarily driven by autoantibodies, they're driven by mutations in calcium channels and some other causes, which we will talk about. So pemphigus vulgaris is a result of autoantibodies against desmoglein 1 and 3. You may have more concentrations of anti-desmoglein 3 in some variants of pemphigus vulgaris. You might have more uh, autoantibodies against desmoglein 1 compared to desmoglein 3, but still having some desmoglein 3. Again, if it's just desmoglein 1, it's probably going to just present like pemphigus foliaceous. So you, the desmoglein 3 is going to be the most important aspect of this. And in fact, we can measure desmoglein 3 levels in the blood, the autoantibody uh, levels at least, to look at disease activity. Erosions of the skin and the mucosa are more common because desmoglein 1 does not is not very present, very high in the mucosal epithelium, especially at the uh, lower half of the epidermis. And so it can't really compensate once desmoglein 3 gets attacked by the autoantibodies. So remember that if you have erosions in the mucosa as well, it's going to put you more in the category of likely pemphigus vulgaris as opposed to pemphigus foliaceous. Now, of course, you do want a DIF to have some more evidence to say, or even just a, a blood level of anti-desmoglein 3 to help clinch diagnosis. The erosions often start in the oropharynx, so patients are going to complain of trouble swallowing and things of that nature. Usually you're going to lack intact bulla. Hyperpigmented patches can present without scarring. And this entity is positive for Nikolsky sign where the skin shears with lateral pressure. Some images of just kind of the widespread large bulla that can present in pemphigus vulgaris. Again, remember that um, 
the level of the split is, is not subepidermal. It's still intraepidermal. So on histology, you'll still see basal layer keratinocytes, but clinically you can't easily tell that there's some basal layer keratinocytes still stuck there on top of the dermis because it's, it's only a single layer that still has the ability to stay attached to the basement membrane. But most of the epidermis is gone. As you can see here, it looks like a large sheet of epidermis just coming off the patient. And clinically, uh, this can look so severe that people are thinking full thick, thickness epidermal necrosis, like a Steven Johnson toxic epidermal lysis. You might see some targetoid-like lesions or some small circular lesions making you think of erythema multiform as well. So doing a lesional biopsy and a perilesional for DIF is going to be critical, especially if you have no uh, history on this patient, you have to make a diagnosis. Also, you can see this really impressive oral involvement here in this example clinically. So pemphigus vulgaris, you want to see a supra basal split. Again, you may contain some eosinophils. That's not necessarily going to clinch the diagnosis or deter you from the diagnosis. The classic um, phrase that people should know when they're studying pemphigus vulgaris is a tombstone row of basal cells over the dermal papilla. So that's called tombstoning. I'll show some examples of that. The adnexal epithelium is more often involved in this entity as opposed to other types of acantholytic disorders like Haley Haley, which we will show you some examples of. So if you see adnexal epithelium, um, acantholysis, then that'll put you more in a category of pemphigus vulgaris. If you just have an H&E on your exam and you had to choose between pemphigus vulgaris and Haley Haley. The dermal infiltrate as expected is not very specific, just some superficial perivascular infiltrate. Early lesions may just show eosinophilic spongiosis. And again, spongiosis with eosinophils has a very broad differential. So clinical correlation will be essential if you just have eosinophilic spongiosis. And if, if you have other evidence of bulla formation or oral ulcerations, doing a DIF is going to be important to rule in or rule out some autoimmune process, blistering process. So a DIF positive result in pemphigus vulgaris will be a net like IgG and C3 in the lower epidermis. So here you see the single layer of basal keratinocytes, the so-called tombstoning pattern along the dermal epidermal junction with overlying just obliteration, widespread acantholysis. Um, you can see how that's in the lower half of the epidermis mostly because desmoglein one is up here kind of compensating um, because it's at higher levels at the upper epidermis, but it's, it's not good at compensating down here at the lower levels. And here's a nice picture of just that adnexal extension that you see as well. So if you see this on the exam and they put Haley Haley and pemphigus vulgaris, I would choose pemphigus vulgaris if I were you, because this would be a hint, um, as you see this often more in pemphigus vulgaris, if they don't give you DIF information. Now the DIF should be negative in Haley Haley and positive in pemphigus vulgaris, but they may just give you a digital slide and expect you to know that. And here is a net-like distribution of IgG and C3 in pemphigus vulgaris, mainly on, it's more of a bottom heavy staining pattern, whereas it's lightening the closer you get to the overlying stratum corneum. Pemphigus vegetans is a clinical variant of pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, people forget about this sometimes, or they're not, they're not necessarily aware that there's this kind of, it doesn't look like necessarily a bulla, but it's more of a vegetative plaque, verrucous appearing uh, vegetations as well. On biopsy, you don't have a lot of blister formation and there's a lot more epidermal acanthosis. There's a lot of super basilar crypts filled with eosinophils. That's one of the hallmarks of making this diagnosis on exams and obviously in real life as well, even though it's super rare. Um, that being said, the helpful part of this to prove that it's a pemphigus in practical terms is a DIF would show a net-like pattern of IgG and C3 in the lower parts of the epidermis in a pemphigus vulgaris pattern. So clinically, you can't call it pemphigus vegetans if it 
doesn't look like a vegetative lesion. That's what makes it a special thing. And ideally you would want to see these eosinophilic filled crypts as well. So, um, you won't recognize it unless you know it and that you would be looking for it. So this is why we, we bring it up in the lecture as classically taught. IgA pemphigus clinically can present with an annular arrangement, most commonly involves the axilla and the groin. The mucous membranes can be involved as well, although that's more rare. You'll want to look, get some labs on these patients because you can see leukocytosis, eosinophilia, and interestingly, IgA kappa paraproteinemia is correlated with IgA pemphigus. So there's that subcorneal pustular dermatosis type, which I mentioned earlier. Again, don't be surprised. It's in the name that you're going to look for subcorneal pustules in this entity. You will not see that much acanthalysis. The antibody that has been recognized is an IgA antidesmocolon 1. So on an exam, they may give you a scenario of IgA positive and subcorneal pustules and ask you what the autoantibody is. It's, it's an IgA anti-desmocolon 1. The DIF is net like IgA in the upper epidermis. So you can't really make the diagnosis of an IgA pemphigus if you don't have a DIF that shows positivity for IgA. So DIF, again, uh, the running theme is that the DIF is going to be essential if you have any type of vesiculobolus and you want to prove that it's autoimmune related. You can also have an intraepidermal neutrophilic dermatosis type of IgA pemphigus. And the uh, neutrophilic microvesical areas are going to be located lower in the epidermis here, so you're not directly under the stratum corneum. For this entity, it's, it's been kind of unclear exactly which antigens are associated with this, but you will see on DIF an IgA positivity and a net-like distribution throughout the epidermis. Again, you're not going to make this diagnosis unless you have a positive IgA on your DIF. Moving on to a non-autoantibody mediated process, Haley-Haley disease, or also known as familial benign chronic pemphigus. This is an inherited disease. It is not antibody mediated. The mutation that is well recognized is an autosomal dominant ATP2C1 mutation. This is a calcium pump. This is located in the Golgi apparatus. They like to test you on that. Intertriginous skin is, in, is usually involved and it has this wet tissue paper-like appearance. You can see areas that are pretty broad um, on, on biopsy, depending on if you go straight into a macerated plaque, you may see full side-to-side uh, -side involvement with acanthosis and acanthalysis at all levels of the epidermis. The quote that everybody wants you to know about is the dilapidated brick wall appearance. You may see some dyskeratosis, but the amount of dyskeratosis that you see is much less than entities as, let's say, Derrier's disease. So if you see predominantly acanthalysis without that much dyskeratosis, you need to be thinking about Haley-Haley as opposed to Derrier's disease. Sparing of the follicular epithelium is the classic scenario. So again, if you see on H&E slide that you have dilapidated brick wall acanthalysis type appearance but it spares the follicular epithelium, then that puts you in the category more of Haley Haley as opposed to pemphigus vulgaris. Now, if you have the DIF information as well and it's negative, then you definitely know it's not pemphigus vulgaris and it's probably a Haley Haley disease. Here's an example of the dilapidated brick wall appearance showing just kind of widespread acanthalysis between individual cells within all levels. You might see some um, dyskeratosis like changes, but it's not that predominant. We don't have uh, really a hair follicle here to show the lack of involvement. Um, but if there was one, you would expect it to be pretty well intact compared to the image that we looked at earlier, Pemphigus vulgaris. Moving on to 
an entity that's usually brought up in the same lecture as Haley Haley, because you're going to see the acantholysis as well and the mutation in Derrier's disease, also known as keratosis follicularis, involves a calcium pump as well. So ATP2A2 is the mutation you should know. It's inherited. It's not autoantibody mediated. The answer on the exam is going to be ATP2A2, and they may ask you about it being on the in the endoplasmic reticulum as opposed to the calcium pump in Haley Haley, which is in the Golgi apparatus. Clinically, it looks much different than Haley Haley as well. So you usually will have yellow brown crusted hyperkeratotic lesions in the seborrheic areas. I think that because you have more dyskeratosis, basically premature early production of keratin. It, that's why you get more of a keratosis follicularis type change as opposed to Haley Haley, where you don't get as much um, dyskeratosis or early overproduction of keratin. So it's more of just a, a macerated skin phenotype, if that makes sense. Again, the goal of, of derm path and dermatology is to try to help you think about how the dermatopathology findings correlate to what you're looking at clinically. You'll see cobblestone papules of the mucosa, palmo plantar pits, verrucous lesions of the dorsal hands and feet, and red white longitudinal nail streaks. So, as I just mentioned, um, it, it's pretty difficult to actually think about the findings on most of the skin and correlating it with some of these other special site areas. So, if you do a biopsy in some of these areas of special site, you may um, kind of need to do more of a literature search to see the specific findings. Uh, in particular, the red, white longitudinal nail streaks are, are more of a clinical finding and not necessarily biopsied that frequently in this entity. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if there's any newer studies out that actually look at the histopathology and, and how it correlates with the clinical impression or with the clinical presentation rather here in Derrier's disease. If you know of a, of a good paper, uh, please make a comment uh, in the video. Derrier's disease, again, as I said, keratosis follicularis, you see these very follicular erythematous hyperkeratotic papules throughout. Um, in this case, it widespread on the chest, abdomen. Um, it can be on the back, the flank, uh, pretty much anywhere. It's a, it's a whole body genetic disease, and obviously it affects multiple areas, including the nails, as we mentioned with these red and white longitudinal bands and some V-nicking is, is one of the classic findings clinically as well. Now, uh, nail changes in general are uh, complicated. And so there are many types of causes of um, different onychodystrophies, as well as splitting of nails, uh, vertical and, or horizontal lines within nails. Um, so you really have to put it together with the entire clinical picture. If you just see uh, one V-nick in the entire patient and nothing else on the patient, I wouldn't jump to Derrier's disease. That's the point. So just take holistically the entire patient and, and fit it there. Now, I don't know histologically, um, you know, if you were to biopsy the nail plate or the nail bed that you, that you would be able to find too much. But if you went down into the, the nail matrix, you might be able to find that the nail matrix epithelium is much more affected, uh, particularly in the areas where you're having this linear dystrophy and this kind of V-nicking. Again, um, there's a little bit of a hyperkeratotic element to this as well in, in the area just below the, the nail plate there at the onychodermal band here. And so you may be able to um, visualize that dyskeratosis may be contributing to that as well. So in Derrier's disease, as we mentioned, you're going to want to look at acantholysis and dyskeratosis, much more dyskeratosis in Derrier's disease. If you compare it to Haley Haley, you'll see core rons and grains, which we'll show images of, and hyperkeratosis and parakeratosis with a negative DIF. So here is your diffuse acantholysis, your areas of flattened, more basophilic areas, which are grains, 
your more round circular uh, mixture of eosinophilic and basophilic rim core rons. So core rons are here and grains are, are basically here. And you see just diffuse acantholysis and then above that dyskeratosis, much more dyskeratosis than you would see in Haley Haley. Here's a higher resolution image from Dr. Elston's uh, archives showing the grain here, which is more flattened, got a little bit more basophilic uh, or hematoxinophilic material here. Um, and then the core rons, which are more circular, and you can have kind of a thicker, um, more basophilic variant, more hematoxinophilic variant, rather, and then more of an eosinophilic uh, rim on some of these core rons as well. Maybe some punctate uh, hematoxinophilic collections within the center of the core ron as well depending on where it's breaking. So here you're, you're seeing the breaking in the granular layer. Um, you can also just appreciate how much dyskeratosis is happening above the level of the granular layer as well. And the acantholysis is happening really at multiple levels, but um, that combination of multi-level acantholysis, multi-level dyskeratosis should definitely be putting you in the differential diagnosis of derriere's. Now you can have Grover's disease, which is transient acantholytic dermatosis, and it, you can have more of Haley Haley appearing, appearing Grover's, and you can have more of a Derriere's appearing Grover's disease. At the end of the day, uh, Grover's disease is more of a clinical um, diagnosis. Uh, if you have older men, um, many times affected on the back, and it's not classically clinically presenting as a derriere's and there's no genetic proof and it's not classically presenting as Haley Haley and there's no genetic proof, but on biopsy, you're seeing focal acantholysis or focal acantholysis and dyskeratosis with small lesions. Um, you might see multiple patterns in the same biopsy of different foci of the lesions are presenting more acantholysis and then some are presenting more acantholytic dyskeratosis then you can think about Grover's disease. And that's what we're moving on to next. So Grover's disease, also known as transient acantholytic dermatosis, the typical, um, I guess, stereotypical demographic would be acquired disease in older men on the trunk, sudden onset of pruritic discrete crusted papules precipitated by heat, fever, and sweating. So if you've got that combination of clinical scenario and um, you do a biopsy and you can see some focal acantholytic dyskeratosis and the patient never had problems with it before. It just kind of came up in, in the older part of their life. Then you can think about Grover's transient acantholytic dermatosis. Again, focus on the fact that these are typically small lesions and only a few reedy ridges wide on pathology. As I mentioned, you can see multiple patterns, including Derriere predominant patterns, where you've got acantholysis and dyskeratosis, Haley Haley predominant patterns, where you have full thickness acantholysis without very much dyskeratosis, a pemphigus pattern, where you see partial thickness acantholysis, and a spongiotic pattern with only rare acantholytic cells. The DIF is negative by definition. If you had a positive DIF, then that would be considered more of an auto antibody mediated process. So here is an example of Grover's disease. You just kind of see this um, haphazard acantholysis, haphazard dyskeratosis with um, just small lesional area. Maybe this is probably a millimeter wide, maybe less than a millimeter wide here. So, um, and you would look across the entire biopsy to see maybe another focus that might show slightly variant um, ratio of acantholysis and dyskeratosis. Again, clinical correlation with this too. So if the, if the patient um, or if the clinician rather said they wanted to rule out folliculitis and you didn't really see perifollicular inflammation, but you saw this type of change, then it would be helpful to mention Grover's in the differential diagnosis. Moving on to perineoplastic pemphigus. Perineoplastic pemphigus patients often have an underlying tumor or some type of association with malignancy. Uh, 
So you can see on this pie graph here that non-Hodgkin lymphoma makes up a large portion of perineum plastic pemphigus associations. Next is chronic lymphocytic leukemia, then Castleman disease, thymoma, retroperitoneal sarcoma, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, and then other. And other can include just a variety of different malignancies. If the patient has a presentation of painful mucosal ulcerations, oral pharyngeal stomatitis extend, extending onto the vermilion of the lip, pseudomembranous conjunctivitis and evidence of scarring changes, and variable patterns of skin involvement, including um, biopsies that show maybe focal acanthalysis, focal full thickness necrosis, or maybe even entire um, partial or full thickness necrosis, depending on what the, which lesion was biopsied. Maybe an ulcer was biopsied, and, uh, and that's what you, you're looking at. So you may have variable patterns of skin inflammation, skin involvement, skin acanthalysis, skin necrosis. And I often remind my residents that if you've got um, multiple patterns of, of necrosis and multiple patterns of acanthalysis, it doesn't seem to make sense or fit cleanly in one box. You have to always think about perineum plastic pemphigus being a possibility, especially if the patient has scarring changes around the eyes, uh, con conjunctal involvement and involvement of the mouth too. And so clinically, these will often come in as rule out SJS because they've got eye involvement or they got mouth involvement. It may, it may even come as rule out erythema multiforum. And that's because you can have EM like uh, changes of perineoplastic pemphigus. In fact, perineoplastic pemphigus, because there's so many antigens that are being attacked by the production of multiple autoantibodies can literally present like anything more morph morphologically. So perineoplastic pemphigus is extremely difficult to rule out. And in many cases, the direct immunofluorescence may be negative as well, depending on where it was taken and the quality of the tissue and the, um, just the quality and success rate of DIFs in general to capture autoantibodies in the destructive tissue. So many times what's um, kind of more appropriate to be done, clench the diagnosis of perineoplastic pemphigus is not only finding evidence of a malignancy, but also doing an indirect immunofluorescence using rat bladder as a substrate to look for deposition of immunoreactants, not only in a net lag distribution, but also a linear distribution along the basement membrane. And we'll discuss that. So here's a clinical image of perineoplastic pemphigus. As you can see, ulceration around the mouth. People might think about a Steven Johnson syndrome. They may think about mycoplasma-induced reactive mucositis, many different um, diagnoses that you can consider. Uh, if they're immunosuppressed, you'll have to think about infections around the mouth, including herpetic. So, um, Anytime you have oral involvement like this, don't forget to include perineoplastic pemphigus in the differential. Many antibody uh, targets, including desmoplakin 1, invoplakin, BPAG1, periplakin, desmoglein 1 and 3, plectin, and this list is not exhaustive. And each patient is going to be different because each patient's cancer is going to be different and how that stimulates the immune system to produce antibodies against these critical proteins that are important for just normal skin structure homeostasis is going to be different. So it, getting an indirect immunofluorescence and taking the actual antibodies from the blood and putting them on to a substrate and seeing how they, how they react is going to be much more uh, effective in clinching that diagnosis. Of course, I, I wouldn't shy away from doing a DIF at all because you would want your DIF data no matter what. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't just skip over a DIF in any clinical circumstance. So on perineoplastic pemphigus, you'll look for acanthalysis and you may see some lichenoid interface change. You may see single cell necrosis. I've seen cases of full thickness necrosis, partial thickness necrosis, so if you see multiple patterns of inflammation, multiple areas of acanthalysis, it doesn't fit cleanly into any box. Think about perineoplastic pemphigus. Variable acanthalysis, variable superbasal split, variable lymphocytes in the epidermis. So 
I, I think by now you kind of understand the theme of perineoplastic pemphigus is vari variability. The DIF is often going to show a net like intraepidermal IgG and C3 and linear dermal epidermal junction IgG and C3. <clears throat> so moving on to the subepidermal split next. Subepidermal splits include more typical inflammatory entities and then posse inflammatory entities, meaning that there's not as much inflammation. So we'll go over each of these as well. So bolus pemphigoid is the classic uh, learning example for anything immunovesicular bolus. So you have to know bolus pemphigoid. Bolus pemphigoid, as we know, occurs more often in older patients, may start as a prolonged urticarial eruption. So unexplained prolonged urticaria in an older patient who may be itchy, think about bolus pemphigoid, especially the urticarial phase. Classically, you'll see tense bulla on an erythematous or non-erythematous base. This is the classic image here of bolus pemphigoid, multiple tense blisters, some even hemorrhagic or uh, more serum filled blisters. Mucosal involvement can occur. Often we see mucosal involvement more in pemphigus vulgaris, but still possible to have in pemphigus, in bolus pemphigoid rather. Classically, it's it's negative for Nikolsky sign. That being said, um, I'm not, I would not be shocked if you could induce a blister in a patient with bolus pemphigoid. It's not, I don't rely on the Nikolsky sign to make the diagnosis. What I rely on is the biopsy and the direct immunofluorescence, uh, the, the lesional biopsy for the blister and the perilesional DIF, as well as the overall clinical, um, presentation. Autoantibodies to BPAG1 and BPAG2 have been shown to be associated. BPAG2 has been shown to be more of the pathogenic um, target. However, uh, presence of BPAG1 autoantibodies have been shown as well. So as a subepidermal bulla, the other thing that you should remember is you're, you're going to want to classically see a lot of eosinophils. However, you can have eosinophil or even cell poor bolus pemphigoid. So lack of eosinophils doesn't prove that it's, that it's not a bolus pemphigoid. Presence of eosinophils within a bulla doesn't prove that it is bolus pemphigoid. You still need direct immunofluorescence findings to help support and some other things. Um, bolus arthropod can result in a bulla with lots of eosinophils as well. And there are some other eosinophilic rich inflammatory entities and some other um, dermatoses that you should think about if you've got lots of eosinophils. So um, you can review our other lectures on the differential of that, but briefly mentioning um, bullous arthropod and bullous pemphigoid, you have to consider a robust contact dermatitis with a large blister could cause uh, this similar pattern. Um, you could have uh, eosinophilic rich vasculitis that led to a downstream um, tissue destruction and bulla formation. You could have uh, pemphigus uh, gestationis that can present this way. Even pemphigus vulgaris can have lots of eosinophils. But again, you wouldn't expect to have a clean subepidermal bulla rather in a bullous uh, in pemphigus vulgaris. So really taking all the information in together is going to be helpful. Uh, parasitic infections may also result in eosinophilic rich areas, but subethrone blister is something that seems a little bit more unique to antibody targeted uh, entities as opposed to a parasite causing something. So you can have eosinophilic rich leukemias that may present um, with downstream bullet too if you have fluid collection, um, but that's also going to be extremely rare presentation. So subepidermal bullet with EOs on your exam, definitely be thinking about uh, bullous pemphigoid. Salt split. Uh, so the DIF is going to show linear IgG and C3 along the dermal epidermal junction. And if you do perilesional, which is ideal, 
um, that's where you're going to get the cleanest linear IgG and C3. Early lesions may show exocytosis of eosinophils and spongiosis. So early lesions of exocytosis with eosinophils, you can even see that in incontinentia pigmenti. So if you have no clinical information, you're just looking at a slide. Um, hopefully they wouldn't put both of those answers on there and not give you clinical information uh, because you can have lots of eosinophils and spongiosis within uh, incontinentia pigmenti. Urticarial lesions, um, the EOs line up usually along the dermal epidermal junction with no bulla. Again, you'll want to do a perilesional if, you, if you're seeing urticarial phase BP, because perilesional is going to give you the, the cleanest IgG and C3 linearly. So if you have um, a positive DIF for IgG and C3, and if the clinician is asking, is it bolus pemphigoid or is it epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita, then you'll have to do a salt split skin to see if the immunoreactants deposit on the roof of the salt split or on the floor of the salt split. If it deposits on the roof of the salt split, then you can think about bolus pemphigoid. And if it deposits on the floor, you can think about epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. <clears throat> So bullous pemphigoid, classically, that subepidermal blister with an eosinophilic rich cavity. Clinically, urtic urticarial phase bullous pemphigoid, it's a prodrome to bullous pemphigoid without the bulla, variable clinical appearance, urticarial plaques, internalized pruritus only with no lesion uh, that looks like a blister in the classic cases of urticarial phase. You may even see exonus patches and plaques and dishydrotic patches. And these patients often can be itchy before they even develop blisters as well. So we like to remind our residents that if a patient's super itchy and they're just constantly scratching all the time, and it looks like they just have parigo nodules, that sometimes you can have this as the first presenting sign of bullous pemphigoid. So have a low threshold to get a biopsy and a DIF on patients like this that are in that age demographic and they all of a sudden start having this intense itching. Here's a histologic example of urticarial phase BP. So you can see the EOs lining up along the dermal epidermal junction here. you may see some eosinophils up into the epidermis as well, but plenty of eosinophils for sure. Here is a beautiful direct of fluorescence in bullous pemphigoid perilesional. You can see that the epidermis is still attached to the dermis and you have that linear IgD deposition and C3 along the dermal epidermal junction. So this is this could be just an example of, uh, of the C3 slide or the IgG slide. It's showing a linear. Direct immunofluorescence consists of a single slide uh, per antibody that you're looking at. So you would look at your IgG and see a line pattern as well as a C3 slide and see a line pattern. And IgM and IgA would be negative. Fibrinogen may or may not show some things, but uh, mostly it's IgG and C3. And in my experience, at least in fellowship, we had more intense, brighter staining with that C3 band. So that was very, um, that was probably the best one to take a photograph of. Herpes gestationis involves periumbilical urticarial lesions in patients who are pregnant in the second and third trimester is usually the higher risk time to develop these lesions. It's a result of a targeting against BPAG2, and it has the same histology as bolus pemphigoid. The direct immunofluorescence usually shows a linear C3 being much stronger than an IgG. So um, that's probably the answer for your exam. If they ask you, what would you expect to see on a DIF of pemphigoid gestationis, herpes or pemphigoid gestationis? So it's that C3 is, is pretty intense in a linear pattern there. Cicatricial pemphigoid, it's in the name, cicatricial or scarring, blistering disorder with chronic recurrent course. Predilection for mucosa, including oral and ocular, occurs in older males. Autoantibodies, 
against laminin-5, also known as laminin-332 or epiligrin. The beta-4 subunit is your answer for the exam. So beta-4 subunit and cicatricial pemphigoid. That's a part of the alpha-6 beta-4 integrin complex. And predominantly, this beta-4 subunit is associated with the ocular cicatricial pemphigoid variant. So think about the beta-4 turned sideways and forming some sunglasses uh, and, and think of ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. That's how I remember the beta-4. C-terminus portion of the BPAG2 is, is targeted as well in this entity. So autoantibodies against laminin-332, beta-4, and BPAG2 are all possible. <clears throat> Some just striking clinical pictures to show you how intense that scarring can be in the ocular region here. On biopsy, you can see a subepidermal blister within the cavity of the blister. You see neutrophils, lymphocytes, histiocytes. You can see eosinophils, but it's less common than as a, a, compared to bolus pemphigoid. Lamellar fibrosis or scarring in the superficial dermis can be seen. And again, that's that makes sense because clinically you're getting that cicatricial phenotype. Direct immunofluorescence can show linear IgG greater than C3 at the dermal epidermal junction. Dermatitis or pediformis, it's one of my favorite ones because it's, it's so um, reliable in terms of the, the pathology as well as the direct immunofluorescence. Um, so DH affects patients with gluten-sensitive enteropathies, intensely pyritic, vesicular bolus dermatitis on the elbows, knees, buttocks, and scalp. The autoantibody, the answer for your exam is epidermal transglutaminase 3. Here you see these very herpetic looking lesions, right? These punched out erosions and, and superficial ulcerations all scattered throughout, particularly even affecting the intergluteal region in this picture. So doing a lesional biopsy, you'll see neutrophilic superficial microabscesses in the dermal papilla. This is the classic H&E picture of these clusters of neutrophils at the superficial part of the dermal papilla forming these so-called microabscesses. That's the early presentation. Now, as you get a, a more robust presence or a longer term development of the lesion, you may have more widespread clefting and overlying um, epidermal necrosis and erosion formation. But if you biopsy an early developing blister, then you're going to see this classic neutrophils at the tips of the dermal pillow. The answer for your exam is that the direct immunofluorescence is going to be positive for granular IgA in the dermal papilla and along the dermal epidermal junction. So doing a perilesional DIF on this, you will still be able to see the granular IgA deposition, even if you don't see neutrophils forming this uh, microabscess in a perilesional skin and a cleft overlying it, because in the perilesional skin directly adjacent to the developing vesicle, you'll still have deposition of granular IgA. And this is what granular IgA looks like on DIF. So you see these punctate granules along the basement membrane, but particularly in the um, dermal papilla, more concentrated in the dermal papilla rather, and it has this kind of raining down appearance. There are some interruptions where you've got some empty space and you see these punctate granules. So that helps you figure it out that it's granular IgA. And we'll compare um, that pattern uh, to linear IgA bolus dermatosis. Linear IgA bolus disease, in contrast, presents very dramatically differently. Clinically, you'll see grouped annular lesions of bulla with string of pearls appearance. Autoantibodies are directed against bolus pemphigoid antigen 2 degradation product. It can be drug-induced. The vancomycin is, is the correct answer for your exam. Vancomycin, actually, I've seen plenty of cases in my practice of vancomycin-induced linear IgA bolus pemphigoid. So you do see it pretty commonly in the inpatient setting. 
adults and children may uh, present with linear IgA bolus disease in children. It's known as chronic bolus dermatosis of childhood. In that case, it doesn't always have an association with the medication. It may just be kind of idiopathic and uh, there's still more work to, to understand exactly what's causing this deposition of linear IgA um, in pediatric patients. So just kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the linear IgA positive DIF, you have more of a diffuse linear deposition signal along the dermal epidermal junction without as much granular punctate signal. And um, instead of it being concentrated in the dermal papilla, in most cases of DH, you'll see it's more diffusely along the dermal epidermal junction. The histology of linear IgA bolus disease is going to show a lot more neutrophils along the subepidermal bulla as well, um, and will not show as many neutrophilic microabscesses as you would see in DH. And that is illustrated in this picture here. So you've got neutrophils at the dermal epidermal junction. It's kind of this wider cleft here. So clinically, it looks different. It doesn't look like DH. And then histologically, it's, it's much more widespread as well. Now, anytime you have a, a blister with neutrophils, definitely look around and make sure you're not dealing with some type of infection. Um, but doing a lesional and getting a perilesional for DIF will be critical into making the diagnosis. And trying to figure out what induced it as well, because you want to stop whatever is inducing it clinically. So if it was an antibiotic or something that could be uh, taken off of the patient's medication list, then that's going to be the ultimate best treatment. Epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita is an acquired antibody-mediated blistering process. This is associated with lymphoma, amyloidosis, inflammatory bowel disease, to name uh, a couple of entities here that are often leading to the acquired nature of this disease. It presents as a pretty posse inflammatory or non-inflammatory blister with acral predilection. Some patients have extensive mucosal involvement, leads to scarring, milia, and nail dystrophy, and the answer for your exam is to remember that the autoantibody is against type 7 collagen. So when we think of type 7 collagen, we need to think about antibodies against type 7 collagen and EBA, as well as bolus lupus, which we will talk about. And if you think about a mutation in collagen 7, you can think about recessive dystrophic epidermal lysis bullosa. And so... This is the epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita or acquired epidermal lysis bullosa. Epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita can present again uh, with predilection, but not always involving acral areas. Again, you'll see just these tense blisters clinically, which correlate with the subepidermal level of split on histology. Once these blisters rupture, and you're going to have this kind of fibrin rich base of the wound as it begins to heal. Now, classically, the subepidermal bulla is cell poor. You can get dermal fibrosis and milia because it gets down to that level of the dermis. And so the basement membrane is impacted significantly, and this can result in scarring and milia formation. If the patient's itching, they can cause a superficial ulceration by a scratching and then ultimately you can develop superficial scarring as well as milia formation. It can look a lot like bullous pemphigoid too with subhydromal blisters and neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils. And the DIF can look exactly like bullous pemphigoid as well with linear IgG and C3. And you may or may not have IgA at the dermal epidermal junction. So the key way to differentiate bullous pemphigoid and EBA will be using salt split skin and looking for deposition of the immunoreactants on the floor of the split, okay? So that's the only real reliable way to distinguish it. So here's your posse inflammatory or very uh, cell poor inflammatory subepidermal bulla. If this were 
if you do perilesional and then you split that with the one molar sodium chloride solution and you induce a split at the lamina lucida, then you should be able to see deposition of the amino reactants on the floor because it's targeting type seven collagen, which lives down here. Um, bolus pemphigoid and BPAG2 antigens live up here. And so that's why that would be in bolus pemphigoid, the amino reactants would be deposited on the roof. Okay. Here's an example of the amino reactant um, favoring the floor of the split. So this is epidermolysis bullosa acquisita with the linear IgG and C3. Bullous systemic lupus erythematosus presents as non-protic vesicles in bulla in patients with systemic lupus. It doesn't correlate with clinical activity in every case, interestingly. Um, only rarely do patients have other lupus skin lesions. It's in, that's also very interesting. But if you've got diffuse bulla in a patient, they're ANA positive, you suspect some autoimmune function uh, or autoimmune patho pathophysiology, then you have to think about lupus in the differential. Um, the Now, interestingly, the autoantibody that's targeted in bullous lupus is type 7 collagen, which is the same antigen that's targeted in epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. However, interestingly, there's a lot more neutrophils in this entity than in EBA. So, I mean, classically. So your subhydermal bullet with blisters, um, I mean, subhydermal blister with neutrophils looks a lot like dermatitis herpetiformis or linear IgA here. However, very different antigen is being targeted, type 7 collagen. The key is that you're going to have this DIF showing linear granular band like full house. And full house refers to our IgG, IgA, IgM, and C3 all being present and reactive at the dermal epidermal junction. Ideally, okay? Not in every case, but ideally for sure. Lastly, we'll finish talking about Porphyria cutanea tarda. This is a another posse inflammatory bulla caused by reduced activity of heme biosynthesis enzyme and uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, leading to accumulation of porphyrins. Porphyrin molecules absorb visible light, and this causes excess blistering, erosions, milia on photoexposed sites. You may also see patients having hypertrichosis, hyperpigmentation, and scarring alopecia, as well as areas of sclerodermoid induration. This is an inherited phenomenon. However, you may have acquired porphyria-like changes, such as with hepatitis C, uh, alcohol overuse or abuse, and iron overload as well. So the inherited versions are going to be due to the inherited biosynthesis enzyme mutations, such as in uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase and acquired porphyria cutanea tarda will be associated with other factors such as infection, medication or drugs, as well as other um, metabolic or uh, biometabolic causes such as iron overload, et cetera. So just a picture of dorsal bulla blisters on the, I mean, uh, bulla blisters on the dorsal hands an image of a, a hypertrichosis that you can see. And a few other factoids about PCT that you should know. It's subepidermal blister cell pour, as you can see here. You'll want to look for caterpillar bodies or eosinophilic wavy elongated structures on the epidermal side. So those will typically be right up in here, as you can see these little eosinophilic collections. And we'll go, we'll show you another higher power example from Elston textbook. Festooning of the dermal papilla, which you'll see right here, this kind of elongation and uh, clear delineation of the dermal papilla, just kind of projecting upwards. The PAS positive thickened blood vessel walls and the DIF will show nonspecific quote unquote sticking of all immunoglobulins in C3 to the dermal epidermal junction and in vessel walls. But the, the answer for your test is that the vessel walls will be much more uh, positive for immunofluorescence. And um, that, that would be the image that they would show you on your exam. Pseudoporphyria is identical in terms of these histologic findings, but it comes down to ruling out primary porphyria cutanea tarda or other causes of porphyria cutanea tarda uh, 
that we discussed in the previous slide. So here is your porphyria cutanea tarda or pseudoporphyria presentation on histology. Higher power view just showing hyalinized material forming caterpillar bodies and the festooning as well. It's important to remember pseudoporphyria is the same as porphyria cutanea tarda and always accept the history of the patient. So the patient with pseudoporphyria is usually just a drug reaction, often to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or other rare causes. Other rare medications may, may cause this. So getting a, a very good history in the patient's changes in medication or exposure history is essential in linking this diagnosis. But doing a biopsy and even showing that it looks like porphyria cutanea tarda is going to be key. Once you get that ruling out primary porphyria cutanea tarda is going to be uh, essential to be able to make that diagnosis of pseudo porphyria. So in summary, there are some well-characterized subepidermal immunobolus diseases. This table is from Bologna. So remember you have your disease entities such as bolus pemphigoid and associated antigens known to be um, playing a pathogenic role when targeted by an autoantibody. So these tables are for your reference to go over one by one and just remind yourself of the disease entity, the associated antigen, and the location in the basement membrane. I do like to, to point out that many diseases share BPAG2, so know those, and only a couple share type 7 collagen, so EBA and bolus lupus. Also remember that the cicatricial pemphigoid is a laminin-332 targeted process, and laminin-332 is also known as laminin-5 or ep epilegrin as well. Another table from Bologna just showing again the locations of the major proteins, and then adjacent to these locations and protein names, you have your disease entities that are associated with that. So another way to study it and just to also kind of show you side-by-side -side comparison of autoantigens versus the mutated protein. So you can compare, like, for example, EBA and bolus lupus are associated with type 7 collagen, and dystrophic EB mutation is also associated with type 7 collagen. And don't forget about the role of salt split skin in helping to differentiate entities as well. So the key example is differentiating bolus pemphigoid versus EBA and doing salt split and seeing where the immunoreactants are depositing. So if it's on the floor, it's going to be targeting type 7 collagen EBA. And if it's on the roof, it's going to be targeting BPAG2 and bolus pemphigoid. And this is just a list of immunoreactants and immunofluorescence microscopic studies of one molar sodium chloride salt split skin. So as a reference, just to show you where you would expect the uh, localization of the immunoreactants. So bolus pemphigoid, as we mentioned on the roof, um, the roof is known as the epidermal side and the floor is known as the dermal side. So you may see both of those terms used. So just kind of go through this table and uh, memorize what you would expect for each of these entities and link back your understanding to these cartoons to try to memorize the relationships. And the last part of this table here is just to show you uh, the uh, direct immunofluorescence versus immunodirect immunofluorescence. So, um, there's two two different ways to do um, salt split skin. You can do immunofluorescence with the serum and see where the deposition occurs, or you can do uh, salt split skin of the patient's uh, tissue and then look to see measure where IgG is present or where C3 is present. So either way, if you're doing um, salt split skin, and then you're using the patient's own serum to see where that binds on the salt split, that would work. Or you can use the, the patient's tissue itself, do salt split skin, and then measure 
um, by targeting IgG or C3 and developing that fluorescence where the um, amino reactants are attaching in the disease process and help to, um, to get to your answer. So for bolus pemphigoid, it's on the epidermal or roof side. Um, for IgG, that's, that's the cleanest. Um, if you look at C3, it's like epidermal, dermal of both. That's confusing. And so I don't think that's helpful. Whereas um, EB, EBA is cleanly in the dermal side where you're going to see IgG. So that's much more helpful. So I think IgG localization is probably the cleanest thing to do if you're using direct immunofluorescence in salt with skin. So um, look through this table and kind of map out your understanding of the location of immunoreactivity to the cartoon, and that will help you um, be able to get your exam questions correct. All right, well, that's it. So thank you for your attention. I will say that we have some unknown uh, entities that you can look at on some other videos, some digital slides looking at the differential diagnosis of blistering diseases. So I would take a look at that video as well. Thank you.